Good afternoon. So today I'm going to explain what links, fizzy drinks, ships, and a method to make metals stronger. The short answer is bubbles. The long answer, I hope, is a bit more interesting. So, when we look at bubbles in day-to-day -day life, the most common form of bubbles we see is bubbles that are coming out of solution. So you've got a gas dissolved in the liquid, that gas comes out of solution and forms a bubble. One of the most common places we see this is in a fizzy drink, partially because this is an oversaturated solution and therefore the bubbles come out very readily. What we can do then is if we pour a drink rapidly, you get the bubbles forming, forming a large head, as you'd call it in beer, um, on top, okay? This is because you've got turbulent flow here. If, however, we pour it down the side of the glass gently, we do not get bubbles forming, or we get a few bubbles forming, but we do not get the foamy head that you generally see with a turbulent flow. So this is what we call laminar flow is the reason for this. So the laminar flow versus turbulent flow. Turbulent flow creates a pressure drop very locally. So you get lower pressures locally because you get lots of little eddy currents. And rotating flow will give you a lower pressure in the middle. So the lower pressure brings these gases out of solution, creating these bubbles. Now, another source of bubbles is when we get the pressure even lower. So in water, we get the water vaporizing. This was discovered initially when we actually had our first vessel that was powered by a steam turbine. This was called the turbinia. It underwent Navy trials, and when they took it out of the water, and they looked at the propeller, they found all these little pock marks in the propeller. This is a more modern propeller, but the same effect. And they wondered why. why. Why are we getting, all of a sudden, damage to our propellers? The answer, again, is turbulent flow. The propellers create such a large amount of turbulent flow, they get the pressures very, very low, below the vapor pressure of the water. This means the water instantaneously vaporizes, forming a bubble. Now, this bubble will then interact with that turbulent flow. So the pressure is constantly changing around the bubble. You've got a bubble, pressure is constantly changing around it. It will grow and shrink, grow and shrink. As it does this, if you tie, if it's in the right conditions, that bubble will grow and grow and grow. Eventually, it becomes unstable. So it will massively implode. It will collapse in on itself, creating a jet of water that has gigapascals of pressure. So gigapascals of pressure is 10,000 times atmospheric pressure. You'd have to go kilometers deep in the sea to usually see that sort of pressure. Okay? These implosion events are so energetic. They even produce light. They produce light and they produce prodigious amounts of heat as well. But what we're looking at here is these jets and these shock waves. These then can then damage the metals. However, I want to look at how we make metals stronger. So that's not going to make metals stronger. What we can do is then, rather than producing these using turbulence, there's another form of pressure, and that is sound. Okay? You might know that sound is a longitudinal pressure wave. It travels sequentially, going from a high pressure to a low pressure. Okay? So these pressures are the ideal conditions to produce cavitation. So what we do is we introduce these sound using what is known as a sonotrode. So here on the left, 
you have some experiments we did with Imperial College where we are looking at breaking up of clusters of carbon nanotubes using this technique. So you can see this bubble cloud at the top. You've got some stirring going on due to these introducing of the bubbles. It does actually also introduce the acoustics, introduce what's known as acoustic streaming. But what you get is all the bubbles are generally focused around the sonotrode. This is because you get something known as acoustic shielding. The bubbles change the material properties of the fluid. So that the sound waves can't penetrate as far. This technique is used in industry all the time for things like ultrasonic cleaning. It's used in chemistry to speed up chemical reactions. It's used in things like this, breaking up carbon nanotubes to make metal matrix composites and other composites. But what we want to look at then is how this is used in metals. Before I do that, I probably need to tell you a little bit about how metals form. Metals usually form through what's known as dendritic solidification. They start as crystals. So here, you can see this animation. This is a metal growing around the University of Greenwich logo because it was a fun thing to do with our simulation. You've got these individual crystals grow up. Each color is an individual crystal. These crystals, when they meet, cannot merge, okay, because they are at a different angle. These crystals, they grow from a nucleus. So you start with a seed, and they grow like a tree, essentially. They grow up. They always grow, in the case of aluminium and a lot of metals, perpendicularly to each other, because these are cubic centered metals. Okay, so they're always growing perpendicular to each other. They're always at the same angle or 90 degrees to that angle. When they meet, the surface energy is such that they cannot merge. So this forms what we know as grains in metals. To make metals isotropically strong, so that's a big word, so strong in all directions. We want them to be uniformly strong in all directions. We want very small crystals, okay? To get more small, to get smaller crystals, we want more crystals. So therefore, we want more of these seeds. We want some nucleation sites to form these crystals. A common way to do this in industry is to use what's known as a grain refiner. These are powders and microscopic or even nanoscopic particles that act as the nucleation sites that are introduced into the metal. The problem with this is that means we can only recycle that material with other materials of the same type. It becomes very difficult. We can, that means we'd have to separate 50 different types of aluminium because they've got 50 different types of grain refiner. What if instead we could use something that's already in the metals? Okay. And the way we do this, something I haven't spoken to about before, is there is a large amount of dissolved gases in metals, particularly when they're in molten phase, particularly hydrogen when it comes to aluminium. When we produce aluminium, aluminium is a very reactive metal. It reacts with the water vapor in the air. This does two things. It forms an aluminium oxide layer on top of the aluminium, and it also produces hydrogen. Okay? That hydrogen dissolves in the aluminium. This can be a problem when we go to cast that aluminium because the bubbles will come out as it solidifies. This leads to what's known as porosity. We get lots of little bubbles in the solid material. Hopefully, I don't need to explain why that might be an issue. When we do that, we get those two issues. And then the oxides can also get introduced into the melt. 
They're in what are known as oxide inclusions. So we've got this hydrogen. So rather than vaporizing, we go back to the fizzy drinks and we take that hydrogen out of solution using the ultrasound. The reason for this is to get down the vapor pressure of a metal is incredibly difficult. We wouldn't really get there unless we were having a very high temperature or even lower pressures. So instead, we create the bubbles from the hydrogen which is in the melt. This has two benefits. One, we remove the hydrogen. If we don't get the bursting bubbles and just get large bubbles, they will float to the surface. We'll lose the hydrogen. The bursting, the imploding bubbles, will break up the impurities like the aluminium oxides. So we turn those aluminium oxides from largest chunks, when I say largest, like millimetres, to nanoscale particles. We also change the surface energy of those particles in the process, and they become the perfect seeds for these dendrites. So this gives us a built-in grain refiner in these materials. We can just, treating it with sound, we get a built-in grain refiner. The issue with this technique, however, is we looked earlier at the traditional way of introducing sound into these fluids. It was to use a physical sonotrode. A physical sonotrode, because it is in contact with the melt, A, you can only do that on low temperature metals because you need the sonotrode not to melt, and B, the same thing will happen to the sonotrode as happened to the propellers. You get lots of little pop marks in them, bits of the sonotrode break off. That is introducing extra impurities into the melt that we do not want. Instead, what we do, or what we are planning to do, or we've done this experimentally, is we make use of the fact that the metal is conductive. So what we have is we have an electromagnetic coil on top of the metal. This electromagnetic coil induces a current in the metal. That current interacts with the magnetic field. That creates a pressure in the surface of the melt. Works exactly the same way, or not quite exactly, very similar to the way a speaker works. So a speaker, you have a wire around a piece of metal, that moves the piece of metal. So we're moving a piece of metal, we're moving the surface of the liquid. This gets some sound waves into the material. Fortunately, these aren't quite low enough pressures. So what we need to do is we need to resonate the vessel. This gives us resonant modes so we can get pressures low enough. And we've performed experiments with the University of Birmingham on this where we have got significant grain refinement on what's known as commercially pure aluminium. So this is aluminium to buy off the shelf. We get significant grain refinement just by treating it with sound. So hopefully I've given you a bit of a potted history there of how and why bubbles can strengthen metals. You might be wondering, well, why? why? Why do we want to strengthen metals? You'll notice I've been talking a lot about aluminium. Aluminium is what's known as a light metal. It's a lot lighter than steel. But it's not usually as strong as steel. If we can change the structure of these metals to make them nearly as strong as steel, we can reduce the amount of steel used in an aeroplane. That will reduce the weight of the aeroplane. That means that we can use less jet fuel. That means we have lower carbon emissions. Okay? We want lighter metals. To get lighter metals usable in more situations, we need to have stronger light metals. So thank you very much for listening. Hopefully I haven't completely confused you all.
as I am often want to do. But thank you very much.